Good day, my friends. This is Rick the Fat Man, and welcome to your seat at the table. This particular set of videos I'm working on is my observations and questions and opinions of J.R. Tolkien's world, Lord of the, uh, Middle Earth, uh, related to general and gaming enthusiasts, whatever. Right? Okay. One of the things that they talk about is the unbroken line of Isidore. Otherwise, Aragon has a strong claim to not only being the king in Arnor, if there was an Arnor, but he would also have a claim to Gondor, or the high king of both Gondor and Arnor. Now, this applies to some mild degree that even though Ar Arnor as a nation is is no longer viable, it's defunct, that there's still some grounds for kingship. And just how does Aragon's bloodline survive a thousand years after the fall of Arthedain until the War of the Ring? There is this unbroken line of chieftains who lead the Unorian Dunedain, who in theory don't exist. The country as, a, as an entity is no longer accept it, it's gone. It's it's constantly or it's repeatedly mentioned that it is pretty much an abandoned wasteland and that nobody inhabits it. And I have my opinions on this and I don't think they're totally valid. I don't the I think there's more going on here than what is publicly known per se to the Dizians and inhabitants of Earth. So, I got my points, my notes. One of the first things is, how is it, first off, how did, it, how is it possible for an unbroken line to, to, uh, to succeed as well as flourish for a thousand years in a wilderness? It's something that, you know, it, it, not only are, is Aragon's bloodline the heir to the kings, or the blood of the kings, but they're also ruling chieftains, which means they're ruling over somebody. And it's not just an empty wasteland, no matter what the, the, the scholars of the era would want the public to know. And so, doing a little research, I figured I wanted to know just how much of a, of a population base would it be required to have a viable population that doesn't succumb to inbreeding and other geologic or uh, gene, geologic or gene, you know, gene issues. You, know, you have too many, or too few people. Your population is either going to die out or it's going to mutate. It's in any case, it's going to lose what makes it special. In the case of the Dunedain, the Dunedain are Numerians, and the Numerians are high men, and they're high men in part because of, not just because of their knowledge, which they slowly lose over the centuries after the fall of Numer, but because their connection to the elves in the beginning and the extended lifespans that were granted to them through, well, through intermixing with some elves as well as just divine intervention, the uh, would-be leaders of the Undying Land uh, put them in a position to be high men and help them. And time, this, this diminishes, of course, and you see it more so in Gondor than in, in Aragon's bloodline, but Aragon's bloodline is very, I, I don't believe, no, in fact, I can, tell, I can tell you without a doubt, it is not a unique extension of the Numerians. The fact is, there are quite a few still pure-blooded uh, Dunedain bloodlines, or Numerian bloodlines, that still maintain quite a bit of that high, what made them their ancestors high men at the beginning. Uh, so, looking up information. Experts vary from between roughly 550 and 4,200 individuals are required for a population, an isolated population, to remain uh, defect-free, to not succumb to uh, the physical and mental issues of staying together or, or uh, uh, staying in too close proximity of, of the same bloodline. So, when we're looking at a viable population,
situation. Uh, if you, it, 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 in some parts of canon, it talks that um, not only do uh, not only is uh, Aragon's bloodline in existence, but up to at, at some point up to two hundred, a couple hundred uh, Nor, uh, Norian Rangers are also in, uh, in the field doing what they do, and this population of rangers varies over the centuries from situation to situation and in uh, age or uh, conflicts and, and, and up and down up and down of a population base but it's still implied so these rangers not along not to mention the chieftain's bloodline or aragon's bloodline uh, has to have some secure places to, to to have families to raise children to they need to have uh other families in order for them to marry into and marry out of and, and enough and enough families to avoid having the possibility of a genetic issue occur over that thousand years. And I think that there's a lot of that leads a lot of crisis to the possibility that in in reality, if we go and we look at Larnor in general, that there still is a viable population of a Norian Numerians or Norian Dunedain in the north, and they maintain their their population base at, at least at a at, at more than subsistence. So uh, they're more than subsisting. Uh, another thing we have to take into account, or I take into account, yeah, is that okay? You can make the argument that, in my second point, seeking spouses from afar, willing to relocate, uh, like Aragon. I imagine a lot of the Norian uh, Dunedain travel. They go off to the east, to the southeast, they go to Gondor. Uh, they, as, as younger men, younger women, they experience the world per se to gain wisdom and knowledge, but in some aspects some of them may find uh, suitable spouses. And, and I believe because of the faithful mindset, the elitist Numerian mindset that is at the core of most Dunedain, especially Prevalian in Arnor, as opposed to Gondor, that they're going to be very selective of who they they marry and who they have children with. So it's a rare day to see a Numerian or a Dunedain, especially the high Numerian Dunedain, because it's established in canon in the books that there are lesser Dunedain. And we see the outfall or the conflict that comes out in Gondor, the Kenstrife, is a big one of the big reasons that Kenstrife occurs is not just politics and and, and uh, people looking for a power grab, but it's because the bloodline to the king was was in threat. They saw it as being diminished when their their future king spent mo was raised in the north and spent most of his time in the north among the Northmen, which were honorable folk. These are the a lot of the descendants potentially of the the Rohirrim and the men of, of Dale. So we're looking at some the middlemen uh, as they're, they're considered in canon and in uh, and in game references. But these these folks uh, pretty much raised this king, this, this next generation a Gondorian king, and then he fell in love with a Northman woman. And it was more about this Northman woman, in my opinion, the threat to the diminishing of an already diminished bloodline. To the core Dunedain in Gondor, the Gondorian Dunedain, especially those among the can trace their their heritage back to the quote faithful, are going to be very anti. You know, they're going to. They're, they're, that's probably the core behind the Kinstrife. There's a lot more going on in the Kinstrife, obviously, but this was the key kernel problem. Had had uh, the fellow, I know his name. Apology. I know a lot of these names. It's just. When he, because uh, I think Castor was the, the usurper, anyway, when uh, the northern, the would-be king of Gondor is challenged and he has to flee to the north, he uses his friends and allies in the north to help him regain the throne in Gondor, but in the process he's diminished the, the Gondorian uh, Dunedain bloodline for the kingship, and it has its effect in a lot of ways that's not very good for Gondor. At key time in Gondor's history, suddenly the Dunedain are fighting Dunedain, and you've already got a diminished population of pure.
pure-blooded Numerian descent uh, Dunedain, more lesser Dunedain and middlemen than you do the high-born descendants of the faithful. So, these young men and women of the Arnorian Dunedain traveling abroad may go to enclaves where there still are Dunedain, and to some degree lesser Dunedain, and find spouses, and then, then encourage them to translocate, to to come back to what's what, what once was Arnor. Can you imagine having that conversation, some young young uh, person having that conversation with another would-be spouse saying, yes, come live with me in the wasteland of Arnor. There's, it's beautiful, it's, it's wild, it's empty, it's far from any kind of civilization. Uh, we will be totally oblivious or, or you know, innocuous. And we will be lost into the, you know, and they're somebody who's raised in, in one of Gondorian cities uh, or Umbar perhaps are probably going to have a troubling time with it. I'm sure that there's the potential for the one or two occasion in each generation of bringing in fresh blood from an outside Dunedain blood pool, but the truth of it is that that's going to be somewhat rare. So then we look at Arnor itself, my third point. Many areas of Arnor, especially the western areas, are free of orcs, evil orcs, trolls, evil evil people, angry uh, hillmen and tribe tribal people, lesser men, who have a, uh, have a grudge against uh, the, the Dunedain at some point. It's implied in canon that pretty much everything north and northwest of the Shrier is just empty and, and desolate and abandoned wilderness. Uh, there may be the occasional uh, middleman uh, in, in the books, in the game material, they're called, uh, there's a group of, of men called Rivermen. And it, they're like a, a loose tribe of fur traders and merchants that travel all the waterways in uh, the in Arnor and in northern uh, uh, the Anduin Valley and things like this. The, and that they uh, control uh, the water travel on the on these rivers, and uh, to to a, to a large degree, these are uh, a, a lesser race of men. That, as that I would assume is a kind of a conglomeration of different uh, races that have found this style style of life uh, lifestyle uh, acceptable, and they are by nature, according to the canon uh, in, in game beta canon, they are by nature very uh, a close knit group. They don't generally gossip or talk, and they most certainly won't talk about their their access to their uh, customer base. And they trade with and where they trade with, except among each other, and then even then it's on a limited basis. So, what we have then is this propaganda or this accepted dogma that once Arthodyne fell, pretty much everything was abandoned and this has turned into nothing uh, just an empty space of land that can be, you know, never, that's not to be exploited for another thousand odd years after. Uh, and Aragon takes over as High King of both Arnor and Gondor and reestablishes, officially reestablishes Arnor as, a, as an entity. But there's why there's no there's no in canon evidence or commentary, nor is there any in beta canon, nor in any of Tolkien's works, uh, his notes and stuff that I am aware of that talks about a mass exodus from Arthedain. From Arnor proper, that the majority that that at that point the Arnorian Dunedain withdraw completely from Arnor and, and head to Gondor and other parts where other Dunedain are. Uh, it's after the Gondor's relief army comes to Arthedain's aid belatedly and crushes uh, the, the Witch King's forces with the aid of the Elves. They go home, and there's no there's no mention of them bringing everybody home with them. Or this big land exodus of remnants of families that coming home or going uh, south. So it's, in my opinion, because they didn't. I'm sure some did. I'm sure some relocated to more civilized territory. But when they, they officially, the Earth officially goes down. 
Earth Day officially is defunct, the population remains and starts to diminish slowly. Well, one of those reasons, and I'm looking at the history, in Gondor, this is one of the things that separated Arnor from Gondor from the very beginning. Arnor had a very large pool of lesser men. They had the middlemen, they had they had hillmen and dun landings, and they had the Easterlings, they had influxes from the far east and the south. They had a, a lot of men to work with. This is one of the you know, why they're, they're, they were able to be successful so often in their thousand years of history after the fall of Arnor. Uh, they have a lot more population base led by the high level or the high bloodlines of the Dunedain, the Numerian descendants uh, and the faithful descendants of the Numerians in Gondor. So, most of the lesser men lesser man, man tribes, if you will, in the north are fixated in the, in the western hill land of, of the Misty Mountains, where the Dun Landings, or the, and the Dunnish hillmen, and hillmen in general, still maintain some tri loose tribal uh, existence in small villages and so on and so forth. But they were never in great numbers to begin with, as opposed to farther south. In the north, it's a much harsher territory to out of living, especially when winter comes, than it would be to the south. And you have in the Misty Mountains themselves a very large challenge. This implies this goes hand in hand with what I meant by the western sections of Arnor are pretty much shielded and protected from orcs and trolls. We we have no evidence, no words of large concentration, uh, large uh, orcish uh, village or. Uh, Holds. Uh, there's no trolls wandering the hills uh, of, of the western Arnor that we know. They're in the far east, they're in the troll fells and the cold fells along the mountains uh, east of Rydor. That's what, and in Rydor itself, the, that eastern province of, or former princedom of uh, Arnor itself, and to the far north. There's Karn Dum and, and there's Gundabad, two massive uh, orcish. Uh, citadels with huge orc populations that up and that vary up and down, but mostly they 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 control the passes like Goblin Gate. They control the passes of most of the Misty Mountains, and they harass the, the human the human tribes, the human settlements to the east of the Misty Mountains, then to the west. And there's a couple I think reasons for this, starting with once again they they to themselves buy into that this is just an open wasteland that there's really nothing here. They're not really totally aware that the Shrier exists down here, and there's no value for them to trek all this way down here if they don't think there's nothing here. Then they have to deal with the, that, deal with the fact that you have elves in uh, the last only house in Rivendell that's up here who will pick them off in smaller numbers and will alert the larger entities and governments that, uh, that do that do that can affect something major against the goblins and the orcs uh, to the fact that there's a rampaging army of orcs running amok in what was Arnor. And then you have the elves, the elf populations of London and Far London, which in this map is this area down here. And the, we don't have any idea number-wise of just how populated, how many elves live here, but this is probably one of the largest bastions of elves populations left in Middle-earth, in part because it's the egress point for most of them, majority of the elves that are going home or try, are leaving Middle-earth to go to the Undying Lands, go via the Grey Havens, and so the, the elves of the Grey Havens are going to make a point of making sure that no large settlements or con concentrations of evil creatures are allowed to, to set root anywhere near them. So then we add that to the dwarven tribes of the Blue Mountains or the Erlun, uh, we know that there are two separate, there are two separate orcish or uh, dwarven uh, clans that live up here. In addition to the uh, remnants of, of Durance folk until the retaking of, of uh, Erebor, the uh, Blue Mountains are havens for the dwarves, and the dwarves themselves are going to also make sure that they don't have very many evil orc-minded, troll-minded neighbors anywhere close to them if they can help it. This is one of the reasons why I think Gandalf realized that retaking Erebor in the era 50 years before the pending War of the Ring, he knew things were, were in motion, he knew things were probably going to go south. He didn't know the extent at that point, but I bet you he had the wisdom and the foresight to think if we can get the Erebor up and running again, get rid of smog, 
generation, they will play a critical role in what's to come. And it does if you go by the beta canon and the, and the, and the uh, canon of Lord of the Rings. So there's plenty of open land up here, right? And I believe that the Anorian Dunedain in small enclaves and maybe uh, in, in uh, uh, gentlemen farms continue to inhabit this region of Arnor and do so with the concept of a long view, low profile mindset. They realized the, the last king of, the, of Arnor, who then dis, his son chose to become a chieftain, did so more out of politics and a sense of self-preservation than because of necessity. There was still a, vi a, a, a viable population here. He could have rekindled Arthaday or Arnor and, to some degree, but in doing so would have been to probably, in my opinion, invite Sauron to send somebody back here, like the Witch King or somebody else, to finish the job. The whole point that the, of Agmar existing in the Witch King's kingdom in Agmar was to see the destruction of Arnor, the, the removal of the, the Anorian Dunedain and their high bloodlines threat to his, the Sauron's idea of ruling, of ruling all men and dealing with Gondor. He, he, he just... That's, that was the whole point of the, of the witch, queen, witch King coming up here and spending as much time as he did slowly dismantling and diminishing Arnor to every uh, and, and then its successor states, in my opinion. So that makes sense to me that the chieftain would have decided, okay, we need to just kind of go into hiding, so to speak, become very quiet and go about our lives and do so as best we can. And in the formation, in the process, he formed, he formed the rangers, the Norian rangers, the rangers of the north, to at least give himself a military body of sm a small elite group. And these folks were extremely well trained. They're, we'll get to that here in a little bit. Uh, so they, they are an elite organization. And one, one northern uh, uh, Norian uh, ranger is as good as the ten Gondorian line, line soldiers in my eyes. Uh, by training alone and their way of handling warfare, such as it is. The idea was is to screen as much of Middle and Eastern Arnor, including the Shire by default, from raiding elves and or orcs and the goblins and the occasional wandering troll to prevent them from wandering further west and estab establishing themselves and and breeding more of their kind and then eventually taking over everything because if, if, if the Witch King had remained in Agmar, if Agmar had remained as an entity, that's probably what would have happened. He would have, the Witch King would have encouraged his minions to move in and take over and completely diminish and destroy any chance of any kind of population living here, including the Shrier, making it very difficult for the elves and the dwarves to exist. I'm going to take a slight break here for a second, so we're going to hit pause. All right, and I'm back. You know, yesterday I did my regular two videos for my channel, and I did a version of this, and when I went to go post it, I discovered that the somewhere along the line, the sound had gotten turned off, and I didn't couldn't couldn't talk or say anything or couldn't be heard in what I was talking and saying anything. So, like I said, I think partly uh, the reason for having uh, Gondor, or Arnor, the Arnorians basically become not a tribal people because it's implied by Chieftain that they became a lesser tribe. And that's disingenuous at best. And that's Frankie the, the, uh, the desperate shelter cat trying to figure out how to get in here. She's usually able to just waltz through the door. The uh, Let's look at that for a second. The faithful, in my opinion, and I said this in my first video, are have an elitist mindset. They have a, an idea of a manifest destiny. They have a lot of long view philosophy about the world and their place in the world. And another part is that 
they themselves, and they probably can't help themselves, are ingrained into being the gentleman farmer, the gentleman society uh, elite type, and they're not inclined to be hard scrabble uh, dirt farmers who are from season to season are barely able to feed their family or feed themselves, and and they're because it wouldn't in, in that kind of environment, I don't think it would propagate this elite capable long lived long historied people they would diminish in other ways and would either die out or would migrate to other places where they would be closer to other bloodlines of their own line of their own uh, kind and so at the same time we establish they don't have large populations of lesser men inhabiting the region to tap into so they're not going you know so i think that they would have these manners small manor states and small settlements perhaps uh, a thorpe or a, a tiny village of a, of a of a few dozen families uh scattered about into the in the wilderness and cut off from the lion's share of the world in general to keep as low a profile as possible and yet they would still maintain a lot of contact with the elves they would mean they would they would be introspective they would be educating and quite highly educated I believe that they would uh, continue to do what Dunedain generally do, especially the high, the high Dunedain, because there's there's a mindset there that's ingrained into these people, and one of their and it also would contribute to the their their ver, the the Anorian Dunedain, their Numerian history or past. Uh, their bloodlines would become less diminished over that thousand year window uh, compared to the, one, the Dunedain and Gondor because uh, that's a problem in Gondor. We can see that in in uh, the ruling stewards, for example. D uh, Denthar and, and Bromeria and Fremeria are still descendants of a, of a high Numer Numerian bloodline. They are the, you know, they are the hierarchy, you know, at the top Enchilon, if you will, of the Gondorian Dunedain, and by all means are still high Dunedain, although they are themselves do not live as long and perhaps are more susceptible to illnesses and other things that their ancestors would not have been because there's been some diminishment in their blood. But it's implied in canon and in beta canon. Denther, for example, takes a, takes a wife from Do Amrath, and, 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 and this is not a political move as to, to, to entrench him with a actual ruling prince of a secondary country or sec, uh, 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 province of Gondor proper, but because the, the princes and the core Dunedain in Do Amroth are actually probably some of the strongest, purest Numerian bloodlines anywhere to be found outside of Arnor. And to do that, that's key to helping reinvigorate, you know, invigorate his bloodline to some degree, or to try to uh, halt the effect of the diminishment. Because it could be that at some point in the in his Family's blood, his family's uh, history. They have married lesser Dunedain families, and by doing so, diminish themselves in the hair themselves. So I think that there is this this kind of noble purpose, or this manifest destiny, if you will, of the northern or Anorian Dunedain to hold on to tradition, and because a lot of their, the, the the chief bloodlines, the chief families, or the senior families, are descendant from the faithful, the, the four odd ships, or the the possibly two to four thousand refugees that came with Eladel and Isidore to Arnor. And in doing so, there's, like I said, a, a different kind of view and philosophy. It also would allow them, or give them time to uh, integrate themselves to some degree with their elven neighbors, which was one of the reasons, like I said in the first video, uh, they settled the, the, the truth, the faithful in part resettled Arnor was to be closer to the elven, their elven friends who they, they want to emulate. So we're going to then move on to the 
fourth point in this discussion, or I guess whatever you want to call it, the Schreier. I think that the Schreier plays a, a much larger role, a much more, more critical role in the long-term viability and survival of the Arnorian Dunedain, including the line of Isidore, than anybody wants to give them credit for, or they themselves are aware of. I believe that, like I said, we know that the, that the for, 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 for most of their existence, the Shrier, the hobbits of the Shrier, have been isolated from the greater world, in part because they themselves are not a, a traveled people. That's not to say some of them don't adventure, because we know that they do. Uh, we know that they've been, in, they've, they've fought in some of Arthur Dane's wars. They were there at the end when Arthur Dane collapsed in small numbers, and then in the years after that, they've been raided by wolves and wargs and, and goblins and and with with L with pluck and determination and a lot of assistance they may not have been aware of defeated those foes and those foes didn't return they didn't either never returned at all which is most likely so they didn't report back that there's this big population of fat small cheery uh, yo yodels down here that we can go uh, terrorize and, and plunder otherwise I think many more orc raids would have been forthcoming but the fact that uh, they didn't provides a large agricultural and craft base for this northern region for men not the elves because the elves the elves are self-contained they have no need except for the occasional luxury items and trade and and for you know having some amusement at obver observing the activities of the hobbits from a distance uh, have no reason to need anything that the the, uh, the halflings produce and the halfling population is viably large enough and it doesn't keep expanding and expanding if this area was truly a, a, a open wilderness that was open for grabs i honestly believe that over the thousand odd years that the shire would have even though it would have might have been a slow expansion it would have expanded the evidence is that they expanded a couple times uh, in brief bursts here and there, but it was mostly towards the south and to the to the uh, uh, northeast, it uh, or the east, not to the west and and the north. And there's good reason for that, because a few of their elders, a few of their leaders, would be in contact with Isidore's descendants and the descendants of the Arnorian Dunedain, who still live in these regions, these in this in this hilly wooded area, and these river valleys protected and and in a, in a uh, anonymously you know in a I know the word but I can't pronounce it uh, so the fact is that there's this huge agricultural base and this source of crafted items that that would be suitable for the use of men we see that in Brie Brie is a grand example how ho how hobbits and men can coexist and thrive so the possibility that that could have occurred on a larger scale didn't occur is because somebody tried to make sure it didn't happen in very subtle ways and yet there would be certain populations or certain members of the hobbits who would have no problem trading with men and they may not ask questions as to what men and who and why are you you know why are you coming from these wilderness northern lands or asking the river boat uh, the the rivermen who are traveling their canoes and little bar uh, their little barges up and down the rivers why uh, where are you going when you go north what is possibly up there who are up uh, who is up there nobody asks those questions because nobody wants to know and and yet we it's once again this subtly applied if we look at uh, farmer uh, uh, is it farmer marsh Marish, the, the farmer that that uh, Frodo and his group run into, and uh, it's established that he has had contacts. He is with the the Northern Rangers with Gandalf. So why not others? And then we know later that uh, the Sackville Baggotses uh, have contact with a Surman, and through Isengard is an access of goods being shipped to Isengard, whether it's foodstuffs or pipe tobacco and beer, wine, luxury items and things like this. So there is a, an outward ec economy around the Shrier, but not 
well established and not well determined. So the Shrier probably played a huge role in helping this quiet population to continue to exist and thrive. Because you ha and you you the possibility is there. And the, the, there's little hints here and there that suggest something along this line, or you, I can choose to turn it. You're just antsy and antsy. You just can't get through that door. But yesterday, she was all over this table, and I think it was her stepping on something that disconnected my headphone enough that I couldn't get any sound. But that is Frankie, the shelter cat, who likes to be involved. So the trier played a critical role without knowing it. They also provide a substance and secure for the rangers and giving them material or, or providing us uh, a place for them to occasionally come in and purchase supplies or needed material. Although it is su suggested that for the most part the rangers didn't interact directly on a large basis with the Shrier folk. Uh, it would have been in the fringes. They wouldn't have walked through the heartland of the Shrier on a regular basis except for taking the, the east-west road. And probably more of it was in debris. We are also kind of implied in beta canon and in the canon itself that the rangers had territories. They didn't just wander willy-nilly. There was always a ranger who operated around Bree. He wasn't in Bree, he didn't live in Bree, he wasn't established in Bree, or he or she, because who's to say there, there, there could easily be a, a, a female Dunedain rangers, and quite reasonably so. But it, in the Bree role-playing guide for Middle-earth, it there is Halvorn, a wandering ranger who spends a lot of time in the area, and he does so to keep an eye on things and to help combat bandits and keep uh, an eye on the on the cross road and the two roads. And then later, Aragon is known to spend time in and around Bree. He comes and goes. Sometimes years can pass before people see him, but he's there enough that that uh, the local uh, innkeeper recognizes him by the name, and the locals call him Strider. So be they know that he's they know he's a ranger you know some kind of questionable you know so to the point where the Brelanders are aware of the rangers but they're wary of them and suspicious to some degree because these mysterious people just come in and do good things for no reason and where do they go and why do new ones come occasionally so there's they know that there's more and we know that when uh, Pippin and, and Mary and Frodo and Sam reach Weathertop with Aragon, they find a catch and it's and Aragon explains rangers often meet here, they often they often uh, camp here, they often uh, leave messages for each other here. So this is an active network of protectors. You don't have that sort of entity in a wilderness in a wilderness for no reason. Somebody somewhere is supporting them and they themselves have a population base behind them to, to provide the, the uh, fact that, that their existence. Not to mention that you know, their whole sole existence is to protect the line of Isidore, or protect Aragon's bloodline. Well, no, they, that is true, but they're doing a lot more than just that. And I think that shows. So moving on to uh, the next point. Elven help and aid. Like I said in my first video, the Anorian Dunedain, the, the Anorian Numerians settled in Arnor to get close to the uh, starting point, the jump off point of the Yadain, their ancestors. Before the Numer, Numer, Numer was raised and the Numerians become Numerians, they're a Dane. The Adain, if you don't know your history, are the tribes of men who went west of the Blue Mountains into the Belred or however it's pronounced, and got involved in the Elvish Morgroth Wars and fought and died and suffered and triumphed and helped the elves whenever they could. And in reward for doing so, the uh, the high powers be raised Numer and established them and, and did them uh, to reward them. So, and, and I won't go into detail my opinions on what, how, how and what occurred and why it occurred there and why it played into the fall of Arnor. But I, but in that aspect, because it's in the other video, the the elves of uh, the Grey Havens, Linden and Far Linden, and the elves of, uh, of Rivendell, to some extent the dwarves of the Blue Mountains, and much to 
a minor extent, the Schreier. All these together support indirectly this this Honorian Dunedain population, secret population, or this this hidden population that still exists in various ways. Now the elves are not going to sustain them and as a uh, as some sort of uh, some sort of charity, the elves are not going. No, elves have a philosophy of teaching you to fish, not giving you fish. They will help you. They will give you fish on a rare occasion, but for the most part, they want to teach you how to do and take care of yourself and do better. And the Anorians already know this. The, the Dunedain are at the peak of Manish advancement culturally, phys- phys- uh, philosophically, uh, technologically, all of this. And a big part of it is because they they had the Elvish mentors over the over the millennia who helped train them from the earliest to the first age, and give them the knowledge of fishing as a euphemism or an allegory so what we have though is like an economic base the elves are self-contained if they need a new brooch somebody makes a brooch and somebody specializes in it there's somebody who gets great joy out of creating jewelry and there might be only a handful of them because they don't need an industry uh, an armor smith making armor for the elves takes great joy and pride in creating an item, a crafted material, uh, um, an item that's going to not only be aesthetically pleasing, but going to be very uh, very important in helping to protect a fellow elf or in that aspect. So they do it on a case-by-case basis. They don't mass produce piles and piles of, of weapons just to throw them into an armory somewhere. They don't have a reason to do this. Every elf who's going to fight, who wants to fight, is going to have their own handcrafted, custom-made weapon. Even if the weapons are almost identical to a hundred other elves using the similar type of weapon, the fact is each one's an individual work of art and not some mass production that you might find in an Orkish Citadel or in some of the largest uh, man, man-controlled countries and territories. So the Arthodanes or uh, the the Anorian Dunedain are going to get some of the finest weapons made, but more importantly, they probably have some of the finest weaponsmiths of their own. But they would only have a handful. They wouldn't necessarily need us because uh, uh, you don't have the, popu- uh, the, the you don't have the commercial base to support them. And a second, a lot of weapons could come from the dwarves. A lot of armor could come from the dwarves. The day-to-day living equipments. I need a pot and pan. I need needles to throw for for thread. I need thread. I need cloth. Well, this society weaving and uh, weaving cloth and 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 making certain crafts and things like this is quite acceptable but others would not be and they're in a position because of all these surrounding supporting entities to acquire stuff that in a larger human community would be acquired through purchase or trade or barter and from trading much further out so we have no economy in that aspect there's really no need for it other than survival and surviving well and i believe that the anorian dunedain would survive well they're they're going to they're going to be very they're the ones who do farm are going to be very good at it and they're going to know what crops to grow and they're not going to grow huge fields of barley because they're going to trade uh, finer goods or purchase goods from something like the trier if i want beer let's buy beer we can craft our own beer uh, if we need barley let's buy the barley from the from the somebody some farmer in in the shrine. Uh we can maintain uh husbandry we can maintain uh um, education and tutoring and that is something that the elves also provide uh, a lot especially for the highest level the highest families in our, the Honorian Dunedain, such as uh, Aragon. There's a reason. This is one of the reasons Aragon is is fostered by Elrod, because Elrod is crucial in providing him with an advanced education that would not be obtainable outside of a, a very major city, such as Peleager or, or uh, uh, Minas Tirith in Gondor. It has to. That's not to say that these are ignorant backwater, because the, the rangers prove that's wrong. They prove that's a f- false assumption. The fact that they're very articulated and capable and, and, and crafty and intelligent and probably well-read 
and, and, and knowledgeable. It wasn't because it was handed down verbally like a lot of the hillmen tribes would do or the lesser men would do. No, the Dunedain still maintain archives and libraries and tutors and sages and so on and so forth just on a much smaller scale up here. Or they farm it out. They, this is one of the reasons their young people may travel to Gondor or, or other places to add to their educational opportunities. The other thing about the potential Elvish aid coming in is for protection. So it's not unreasonable to see younger elf uh, at would-be adventurers wandering the, the wilderness, so to speak, with Dunedain rangers in protecting this core area and these western areas from this influx of evil creatures and beasts to the east. The reason we don't have a large influx of orcs and wargs and trolls and what have you in this region in part is because of this cooperation between the two and or the indirect protection. Because we know that elves, elven groups like to wander and, and travel the world, the, the travel the world, so to speak, and this area, this region would be rife with that, I believe. We see an example of that in, in uh, The Lord of the Rings in the novel. It doesn't show up in the movies, but in the novel, Frodo and company get to the witty end, and they have an encounter with a elf and his group. And I think there's quite a bit of that going on out here. And some of that would would be the elves visiting the Anorian Dunedain in small numbers and, and just enjoying the wilderness in conjunction with the, 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 the residents who still live here and they're keeping a low profile. So we move to the next point, luck and or divine interference. Some of the reasons why the line of Isidore survives a thousand years through all this line of chieftains to its current to, to Aragon, which then reestablishes everything in part, would because there's some luck involved. You know, that at no point does the bloodline falter because the the chieftain didn't have a child to pass his his title on to. His bloodline was not broken, and or if he was protected or helped. And there's another possible, uh, uh, just like the the. Uh, 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 you know, it's not the elders, but the the mayor and their the star or whatever the, the their their leadership uh, in the Undying Lands still feels some responsibility for Sauron and his actions. This is one of the reasons they send the the five wizards who are supposed to help men uh, defeat Sauron in the darkness of what's left. You know what Sauron's doing. Uh, there's other implications that they've. Inter intervened in very subtle and small ways and this could include helping mask this moderately sized population you know if you think well 500 to 4,000 and I'm inclined to go with the 4,200 I think that it's far more likely that there are 4,200 uh, or in the in the thousands I, I think somewhere between four and ten thousand uh, Numerian uh, or Anorian Dunedain survive at various centuries with that population ebbing and flowing as as birth and death occur uh, there's no major battles there's no major other outside the plague and i think the plague probably would have been very diminished here because of their isolation the the plague did not harm uh, Brelanders as badly as it did places south and the Shrier didn't suffer terribly terribly from the plague so i believe it was even more isolated so the dunedain of the north probably even less so and their richer Numerian bloodlines, their more pure bloodlines, would also help combat whatever illnesses that did occur, and including this plague, which, like I said in a previous video, I believed was definitely manufactured somehow by the, under the influence of evil magics or whatever from Sauron to target the Adain, specific the, the Dunedain and and. You know, all men in general, but really go after the Dunedain, at least make them sick enough to die, because it's established in canon that the Dunedain are very hale people. They're the, the pure of the bloodline, the, the, the further you get to the closer back you get to Numer, the less likely they are to have the, the common cold or flu, or to get something like what we, people might know as cancer today. Uh, it's just in there. So I think that there is some divine interference going on up here. There's a good reason why this, that, that 
the line of Isidore not only remains unbroken, but thrives enough because Aragon is not some rough, he has a rough demeanor, but he's not some unca- uneducated or poorly educated tribal leader. He's a man that men will follow. He has a presence. He has a demeanor about him. He has knowledge and educated. He's learned by the elves, but he's also learned from his own people. And I imagine Gandalf helped tutor him as well and helped give him knowledge. And in his travels, which is in the books, in the in the in the back and the after aftermath uh, of, of Return of the King, they talk about the histories. And again, that it's implied that at the end of the War of the Ring, uh, Aragorn is actually closer to 90 years old. He's older than he remembers serving in Gondor's forces for D- uh, Denthor's father when he was a young man, and when when Aragorn was a young man, and he served in uh, Rohan. He he rode with Rohirrim uh, in a number of adventures for uh, the previous kings so the fact is he's he's traveled to the far east to, he's gone to the herod and far herod probably and in part because errol elrod and gandalf both encouraged him to do this and best to, to understand other men and other manly races but also to uh better understand these people that he was going to have to either combat or negotiate with or subjugate to understand what it means to be a king and not just a king, but a high king. There's more to it than just having a crown and a title. So there's a lot of a lot of help going on behind the scenes, and there's no reason why I believe that there isn't some of that. So moving on to my next point, that faithful elite mindset. Now, like I said in the previous video, the faithful of Numer, the faithful Numerians who came to Arnor, were were of a different caliber than the ones who sailed to and settled in Gondor. They were more introspective and scholarly, if you will. They're more uh, engaged in in uh, philosophy and, and uh, dealing with. Uh, they're more, in my opinion, uh, faithful to the ideal and the emulation of the elves that they they so admire and the teachings that they've learned from the elves. And this is the second crucial key reason why they returned to settle in uh, in Arnor. Not only was it the jumping off point for their ancestors, the Adain, so they're returning to the Adain's last homeland, as it will, because it's implied that even the Adain traveled to the west from the far east where they were where they awoke. Their ancestors migrated until they settled this region for a significant amount of time, and then they moved on. A lot of the the barrel downs at uh, near near Bree are from these these people and from that time. So there's there's this this un this extreme backstory of history here. They also came here because nowhere in Western Middle Earth is there larger concentrations of elves and established elves. Yeah, Loch Lauren is a pretty good sized enclave of elves. I, I don't know. I can only hazard a guess. And there's probably in the 20 to 30,000 range of elves spread out through Lothlorien and we know that in Thundral's Wooden Land there's probably upwards of 10,000 various sylvan elves and others living in that region and in, in and around it, maybe less. But when you come, and of course in Rivendell, what is it, a few hundred? Yeah, Rivendell's called the last homely house or the first homely house for a reason. It's not a colony of elves. It is a small colony, perhaps, and I'm sure I'm sure that the population has grown up and down over the millennia. But for the most part, it's not. It's not a land. You know what I mean? It's not a kingdom. So its population maybe never exceeded a thousand. Where if you go to the far east, where we get to, uh, like I said, over here where we have uh, the Grey Havens, we have Cyrodiil and his folk. And the High King uh, Gilgalad uh, originally set up his, his throne here and ruled from here. And so there's probably the largest concentration of, of elves in Middle-earth in this neck of the woods. So it's, an, a, it's a magnet for these these. Numerian faithful who then become the Anorian Dunedain to come here and settle because then they can be even closer to the elves that they cherish and revere uh, and revere and and emulate so so closely than they ever could have been in Numer. That was 
you know, one of the falls, the cause of the falls of Numer was because of this this obsession with with death or uh, immortality, but also this this longing for this life that the elves lived, that the high men so desired to the point that it it corrupts them. So the faithful are more more philosophical than their aggressive brethren who failed and and saw the destruction of Nurmer, uh, but they still have this craving, this addiction of Elvish culture and, and existence that they migrate here naturally, Isidore and Illidale come here first and his, uh, or Illidale comes here first and then his two sons settle in Gondor and then Isidore returns to the north with the intention to uh, take over the high seat of his father and then falls into Gladden fields and stuff. So I think that faithful mindset also plays a role in why they can take this long-term view. Why not in a thousand years did we not see some influx of, especially when uh, Gondor has several golden centuries, why not during those golden centuries do we not see this attempt to reestablish a, a, a presence in in the Arnor and reestablish Arnor because Gondor didn't find it viable or didn't find it appealing or didn't find didn't want didn't want to bother with it, or was there other, you know, more subtle things going on that dis disinswaded them from from doing such a thing or in any kind of significant numbers because I'm sure certain Dunedain born in Gondor would have grown up listening to the tales of Arnor and the High King of Illidale and and all the things going on up here and maybe would migrate on the individual level and then suddenly discover that there's still a population of, of Dunedain living here and thriving but at no point in that thousand years do those Dunedain uh, show any evidence of re reestablishing themselves as a kingdom. They maintain that chieftain uh, baseline. They they maintain uh, Aragon's bloodline. They retain a lot of their other pure bloodlines, and enough so to be thriving in modest numbers. And in part is because they have that faithful eliteness mindset about themselves, this uh, ability to step out and step above and look down the road for generations. There's a Chinese element involved there where uh, we work today for tomorrow, uh, we, we plan for tomorrow today, and we suffer today so we don't, our, our descendants do not have to suffer kind of thing. So we are going to suffer in noble silence, we're going to operate in an in, in enmity and do our thing and keep to ourselves as much as possible with the exception of the rangers and even the rangers make an effort to not draw attention to themselves outwardly they're not looking for fame or fortune they don't want it they don't need it and part of that's because of that mindset that's ingrained into them that's taught to them that's embedded in their genetics in my opinion so the next point implies a bit with that argument or that discussion the Numerian idea of manifest destiny. And the Gondorian, the Gondorian Dunedains embellish this concept of, of manifest destiny in far more ways and more openly than most people would give it credit. But Numer and the High Men from the very get go were geared for expansion, for uh, spreading knowledge and and wisdom it to, when they when they had it to, when they had it to subjugate sometimes in some not so polite ways lesser human civilizations lesser men to bring them to a more enlightened state if you will there's this we see it all through numerous history where the numorians established many, many small colonies and large colonies. They interacted with most of the major human races all over Middle-earth, even to the furthest east. And it, we also see uh, when Sauron starts running rampage all over, in the Second Age, starts running rampage all over Eridor and uh, western Middle-earth, you know, destroying uh, Austin Austinel or whatever it's pronounced, the Elvish city that was probably the most technologically advanced Elvish or city period in Middle Earth history at that point. Uh, it takes an army of Nurmer to put Sauron down. 
and they do it with such what such a heavy-handed fist with such arrogance and and uh, confidence confidence verging on arrogance and they do it in such a manner that it stuns even Sauron and Sauron find, uh, submits to Arfrasan the the king of Nurmer much to the destruct to the dismay and final destruction of Nurmer and his people to for the most part it was a very bad win for them and they just they didn't realize it but there's that manifest destiny that they're meant to lead that they're supposed to lead by example and or through deed and action men and they tried to do this this manifest destiny is is also potentially ingrained in their culture and in their philosophy and in their genetics they they can't help themselves from taking the lead whether it's you can make that argument to some degree the, the, the Battle of the Last Alliance when uh, the Anorian uh, uh, Dunedain take the field and are at the forefront of major, pretty much every major conflict in that three or four year stretch until the fall of Sauron and the fall of uh, Mordor and much to their detriment they take so many casualties so few of their their you know people, their men go home that it See, it's it initiates the the sudden the slow decline of Arnor, at, because it just it crippled it crippled them to the point where they could not maintain it as vast a territory and uh, that it did. And I imagine that, like I've said, the Numerian, the Dunedain themselves, because especially the earlier versions, the faithful would be some of the longest lived Dunedain in Middle Earth until their generations start to wane and their their bloodlines start to diminish and intermingle. So if you're going to if you're going to live two or three hundred years, you're not going to be in a hurry, as much of a hurry, to propagate and raise children and a family and settle down, etc. etc. So the odds are that a lot of these these uh Anorians that went to war didn't have a large pool of replacements at home and that left a lot of people home with a, and I, I go into better detail on that in a, that previous video, so I'm gonna I'm gonna avoid getting on that. So, my phone. Yeah, I'm getting to, getting down to my last three points, and this this next point was kind of implied with some of the earlier stuff I was blab I was bad, blathering about, keeping a low profile for the centuries before the War of the Ring. Once again. We're looking at that mindset, that manifest destiny, but that that faithful determination and perseverance, this forethought of presence. We're going to plan for the future. We know today we cannot influence politics. Why didn't one of Isidore's descendants, much much earlier than Aragon, decide it was his time to go to Gondor and lay claim to the title of, of the High King of Men and uh, Arnor and Gondor. At what point, once the, the king the king's lines fail, the, the uh, lines of uh, Anorian in, in, uh, in Gondor falls and fails, why is it that we don't see one of the blood of Isidore go to Gondor and try to take claim of the, of, uh, the title? Well, you know, who's going to, after we see, in part because of the actions of the Ken's Drive, is a good reason why they're not, Gondor's not ready for that sort of thing. They're not, a, they're just still strong, but they're not mindfully f prepared or ready to accept somebody coming from this vast, unsettled, failed kingdom laying claim to the, to the throne of, uh, of Gondor. And I believe part of that is feeds into the reason why they choose to keep a low profile, to to observe from a distance, to interact when they can, but mostly for the most part they're back here protecting their heritage and Isidore's heritage and claim, as well as protecting this area that once was Arnor and once again will be honored because they can you know, they believe that it's just a matter of given time you know it doesn't matter how many generations it takes sooner or later the king will raise makes for a great story and stuff but the politics and the mindset behind such things i mean a thousand years for human beings to wait that's that's just uh you know that would be the the equivalent of 
the American population at the time of the War of 1812 submitting to the English after having been a free entity as their own uh, government, their own uh, uh, country for a small amount of years and then deciding, okay, well, we're going to be patient. We're going to wait until England fails and then we'll retake our we'll, we'll re regain our, po our, our place in the world and stuff. And, and it just doesn't, doesn't add up that well to me, right? So that's, you know, why, why the chieftains, you know, between the fall uh, of, of Arthur Dane and Richard King, uh, the chieftains themselves chose that title as a lesser title. Uh, but it's still an important title because it still lays command and control, it, it, a claim to leadership. It is the leadership of this quiet, hidden population that remains in Arnor and has a, a, a dream and a, a purpose. They strive to not only protect their own bloodline, because that would have been simple. Go to move to Rivendell and never step foot out of it. Or move to Linden. If the elves would have a, a, a small contingent of Isidore's family living there forever. Alright? But they don't. They maintain their own their own existence and support their own people to protect everybody so that's where the rangers come out the rangers serve this important role the chieftains lead the rangers but the the, the chieftains would not have as much clout if they didn't have the rangers of the north to begin with as an entity the rangers are crucial to supporting and protecting this this fledgling or this quiet backwater population of Dunedain allowing Isidore line to flourish and survive and and not have to fight tooth and nail their entire existence or you know, not fight and and scrabble hard scrabble farm just to feed themselves you know, how well, where would they have time to learn how to be expert marksmen and expert fighters and expert uh, survivalists and expert you know this all comes with knowledge and time and learning it's not something you can do if you're if you're scrambling around trying to make sure uh, there's enough to fill your belly every day and, and take care of your kids uh, or protect them from the wildlife that are you know the bears and wolves and other things that still exist uh, let alone per patrol regions to the east to make sure that the real evil nasties stay far away as possible all right so that leads us to my final point of Rivendell's role, or Elrod's role in all this. I think Elrod, because his attachment to the line of Isidore makes perfect good sense, because it's his kin. Aragon is, is his kin. His brother Elros was the first leader of Numer, and it's through Elros that Aragon traces his bloodline. And so it's also to Air, to, to uh, Elrod's ad, uh, ad, advantage or interest to make sure that these guy that this bloodline and these Dunedains survive, but survive in such a manner that they're not diminished mentally, physically, spiritually. They're not some hiding a, a, a ragged troop of ancient you know what leftovers hanging in the wills in the in the hills in the, in the woods and barely barely eking out a, an existence no they're they're still an advanced high 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 man culture and are supported so the elves in in subtle ways and not so subtle ways help with this help with education help with uh, knowledge occasionally giving them gifts you know, uh, fine weapons or armor or knowledge or, or what have you. It's also to Elrod's advantage to have the rangers do what the rangers do. It, it, it makes perfectly good sense to, to have as many allies as he can to help protect his people and his home from the evil forces that still abound in this in, in his general region because Rivendell is much further this way than what the map allows so we're talking quite a ways away yet so there's a lot more territory between there and, and uh, you know, Bree that's not in this map so it's to his advantage plus he has this I don't know I don't want to call it a, a, a familial uh, responsibility, but he, he believes this. He believes that it's his. He needs to look after his 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 uh, 
nieces and nephews, his brother's lineage, because nobody else will. If he doesn't, nobody else will. So Rivendell plays a crucial part. Rivendell also acts as the 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 holder of the accruements of Arnor, uh, the staff of uh, Anumas, uh, I think it's the, the Ring of Bahir, uh, the Shards of Narsal, other things. Now he sets up a shrine, he's that little museum, and this is where he can help educate the the descendants of Isidor and other member other high bloodlines of the of the Anor, uh, Anorian Dunedain who still still exist as to their heritage and why and what and what for and why and give them purpose and goals and help helps to counsel patients counsel care don't go out to the world and talk about all your people back home. Don't go out and talk about the little towns and stuff. You even, you know, did it even bother to? You know, nobody even knows if they exist, let alone if they were named. But there would not be any significant population base that that would be concentrated. They would be spread out in small groups or individual families, and it would interact like a tribal base to some degree. But they would also see themselves as the descendants of a great of a great house of a great kingdom of greatness of a great people and that they have a responsibility themselves to continue this and to help maintain this philosophical claim so it's it's more so so when aragon is revealed to be the descendant of Isdor, the true king of gondor and arnor the, the gondorians are now ready for this they are the, the ruling steward family is decimated. Uh, the ruling steward himself kills himself. Uh, the country is, has been ravaged by some pretty harsh conflict in crucial areas. Uh, there are evidence of this army of the undead coming to, to, the, to the aid and the direction of this person. Uh, the Roharium respond to him with great love and, and support. Uh, these so other, other human nations see Aragon as a leader and a ruler. He's also a healer and a, and, a, and a knowledgeable person because of Elrod teaching him these skills and showing him how to do it. There's a, you know, why, how is it that Aragon is this, has this knowledge of healing that's not, not common or not displayed anywhere else in the human, uh, in the human, uh, base that we see in the movies and in the book well in part because he is a descendant of Elros he is at the core a bit of Elvish in him and because that gives him an opera, a, a beginning point and then Elrod teaches him these skills and shows him how to to connect with that heritage to utilize his bloodline his blood heritage to do things that are about a little more than the average Joe and the knowledge that is just given and taught to help other people. See there's there's a huge role that Elrod plays in the success of this whole story and this whole people. So it's my thoughts, my opinions on just how did the the bloodline of Isidore survive in the north to be relevant at the end of the War of the Rings. Till next time, this is Rick, and this is your seat at the table.